Every scientist who is contributing at a high level has always worked at the international level. If we go back 500 years, you will still find people talking across national boundaries. The only way you can make an impact in science is if you are actually aware of what everyone is doing in your field and then meeting people at conferences, workshops, learning what they're currently doing before they publish uh, so that you can play at the top end of the scientific community. Do you have a, a particular example based on your experience in which you can... Every single bit of work I've ever done fits into that category. I think, I think what I want to say, however, is the scientific community at large is used to working as individuals. Scientists have big egos. They work as individuals. It's quite difficult for them to work as teams. And the big transformation that has taken place over the last 20, 25 years has been moving people from that single person operating as a scientist to working as teams. And this really is a big advance. If we look at the European Union, for example, uh, the collaborations across countries in Europe have been massively fostered by research grants from the European Union and those research grants require that at least three countries are involved in each grant. And so what, what you have is collaboration built into that process. And this has proved to be very powerful for the development of science in Europe. Uh, in the United States, the US is a very strong contributor to science. I think, however, that the US suffers from the fact that US scientists tend to talk to each other more than they do to scientists outside. Now that's a, a difficult generalization. They, many of the best scientists talk to all the top scientists, but I don't think that is true in Europe. I think in Europe you'll find that people are really interacting with the global science scene. Even within the political turbulence that we are probably experiencing globally, or is there a, a challenge or a, probably a threat to this idea of collaborations? I don't think that political turbulence has really got in the way of scientific collaboration, except in extreme cases. So for example, in the Soviet Union, during the period of Stalin, there was very little collaboration between Russian scientists and scientists in the West. However, here in Cambridge, we had the leading Russian scientists coming over even during that turbulent period because scientists are really interested in the problem they're working on and they really are not too interested in the political system around them. That is now changing and it is changing for a very different reason from what you're asking. We are all recognizing that there are now global challenges and the scientific community is needing to talk about these global challenges. This is very difficult because it involves an interaction between the political community and the scientific community. Uh, when I was chief scientific advisor in the British government, I had to work with problems such as the spread of diseases. Uh, but the biggest challenge today and it's the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced, is climate change. And when I say the biggest challenge, I believe what we do on climate change in science, engineering, social sciences, over the next 10 years will determine the future of humanity. In other words, I think it is a, an existential challenge to humanity, and it's happening far more quickly than most people recognize. This means that we need the political community to understand the nature of the challenge. And so I address your question by saying, at the present time, Trump and Bolsonaro, to take just two examples, are people who reject the science of climate change. It's like burying your head in the sand in the face of a terrible onslaught on humanity. And that that is a problem because if Trump appears 
at a climate negotiation, he appears with 160 people who go around trying to persuade countries not to act on climate change. So as soon as we talk politics and science, we're talking about these major global issues. And this is where my view is it requires at least the kind of effort that J.F. Kennedy got when he said, we are going to put a man on the moon in 10 years. It will require a massive effort of at least the leading nations. And the scientists and engineers will be drawn into these programs. And in your opinion, um, can a program like Shaping Horizons contribute to that? And in which way? Every contribution at every level is important. So if, if we take Shaping Horizons, I've been to, I've met many heads of government in Latin America in my position in the British government. Uh, I had two positions, but the, the main thing is, <clears throat> if we talk to each other about what we are doing, we spread the importance of the messages that we are engaged in. So if we look at this group, Shaping Horizons, you're bringing Latin Americans together with the British people, young people. The, this is the future. Young people, you guys are the future, not me. I can get very impatient with people who don't understand the nature of the challenges, but younger people are responding to it extremely well. So I, I think that Shaping Horizons is one of those things that can really make a difference. Thank you very much.